It's the How Games Make Money podcast. I'm your host, Jeffrey Grubb. Joining me this week is Rami Ismail, who is an indie developer, one half of Lambeer, executive director of GameDev.World. We're going to talk about all of that and more. First, though, I want to thank you for joining me. You can get more from me at GamesBeat.com. If you like the show, you can rate us on your listening app of choice. If you are watching on YouTube, you could subscribe to the show on Google Podcasts, Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcasts. And if you like the show and you want to help out, one of the best things you could do is tell your friends about it. Tell people, tell your coworkers, anyone who might be interested in the subjects that we discuss here. That's one of the best ways that you can help us get out there and, and get more ears listening each week. And I'd really appreciate that. Okay, let's get to it. Here's my conversation with Rami Ismail. We talk about subscriptions. We talk about how much the industry is changing. We also talk about what the recession is going to mean for people who make games. It's, it's very insightful, very informative. Let's go to it right now. All right. Joining me now is Rami. Go ahead and say hi to everybody. Hi there. I want to just jump right into this, but do you want to like give everyone like a, a title or anything? Do you want to like say where, where you, uh, where you work? So yeah. It's, it's, you're, you're everywhere, so it's hard to describe me. So why don't you do that for me? <laughs> so I am uh, Rami Ismail. I'm one half of Dutch independent game studio Flambeer. We are the creators of games such as Super Crate Box, Ridiculous Fishing, Luft Trousers, and Nuclear Throne. I am the creator of Do Press Kit, which is a free tool to create press kits. I'm the executive director at GameDev.World, which is a free online virtual games conference. So I want to talk about all of that. Let's start with Vlambeer, though. Um, it is, what is it like working in indie games in 2020? I mean, that's a rough question, isn't it? Yeah. Because the yeah. experiences nowadays are so varied and, and different. I think... You know, Flamber is almost a decade old now, and and back in the days in in like 2010, 2012, you could somewhat you could somewhat argue that there was like the indie experience, right? The indie life, uh, where you would start with the game idea, make the game idea, start to network, get to meet people, go to an event or two, and then release your game on Steam. And then either it would make you lots of money or it would make you no money at all. Um, And those were kind of like the two extremes of independent game development. That that was, that was what it was either one or the other. I think nowadays with the, with the spread of independent game development around the world and the different people that are making those games and the, the different circumstances in which they live, but also the access to more marketplaces, the, the the sort of experience of being an independent developer has become so variable that um, it's hard to say. Like, Flambury is in a very comfortable position. We've had a number of hit games. We're still, um, we're still continuing to exist based on the revenue of those games. We have a new game coming out soon, but we're not in any particular hurry. Um, we've been very fortunate to be at the right place at the right time with the right game. Uh, a number of times, and Flamber is is effectively the the way it's working now is more as a as a side project for the two of us than our main focus, which is incredibly privileged. Um, but it also obviously means that our experience is very distinct from most people's experiences. Well, let's uh, let's try to find uh, maybe some of that commonality for people. Where where did it uh, switch over from? We are trying to make this happen to oh, this Vlambeer beer business is going to work and it is going to be able to way it's going to be the way that we pay for our lives. So we when we started, that was always our goal, right? We started Vlambeer very explicitly with the goal of let's make cool games and pay rent. Um, it was never just an ideological proposition. We didn't start this company hoping that. We would just make cool games and then maybe money would happen. The, the goal from the start was how do we promote ourselves? How do we market ourselves? Uh, how do we get at- attention in, in, a, in a market that even then felt overcrowded? Um, so our first game was actually released for free. Super Crate Box was a freeware game. And it was effectively because we're bad at everything but making games. Um, it was our business card. We had no gra- <laughs> we had no graphic right. design skills. So we just thought, well, why don't we just make a game our business card? Um, and that was our that was our foot in the door in the industry, and then we actually did not make money with uh, Super Crate Box or uh, even some of the games after that. 
Um, we made a little bit of money releasing a Flash game called Radical Fishing, and that was enough to finish Super Crate Box. And then originally our plan was to make money with Super Crate Box, but then that game ended up free. Um, the first time we really earned money in the games industry, we did another Flash game for uh, Adult Swim. And then we got approached by a little indie outfit uh, publisher that was just starting out in indie publishing, and they owned the IP to Serious Sam. And nobody had heard of these people, so we were a little reluctant. Um, so, so we decided to pitch. They asked us to do a Serious Sam game. We thought they were a bunch of you know like suits that just wanted ser- Super Crate Box, but with a Serious Sam skin. Uh, so we. We really like Serious Sam, so we didn't want to turn him down, but we also didn't want to say yes because we didn't want to be exploited. So we pitched the worst possible game idea to them that would still be fun to make. And Serious Sam is this really fast game about shooting and action and jumping and running around. So we, we pitched them a turn-based RPG, and they took it. Uh, so then we had to make it, uh, which was a bit of a surprise. That that publisher eventually uh, you know, is now known as Devolver Digital, Sure. Um, so they, they have that sort of rebellious streak from the start. That was the first time we made money with a game, I would say. And then uh, not too long after that, uh, we started on Ridiculous Fishing. And um, that had a very long development cycle for us, like two and a half years. It got cloned somewhere halfway in the middle. Uh, during that time, Flambeer sort of um, prestige or like visibility had been rising slowly, but the clone really kicked things off for us in the way we responded to it. Um, we were very aggressive about it uh, and about like the value of creativity. And I think it, it landed us in a, it put us in a spot that a lot of people wanted to support us. Um, so instead of, you know, like having the clone destroy the company, which it almost did, we, we turned it into a, a marketing um, opportunity, a visibility opportunity, but also a statement um, of what our studio is and what it stands for. And um, we started developing lift routers at this, you know, to, to keep ourselves happy during that re- really difficult time with the, with the clone. And those two games came out pretty much at the same time. And both of them were hits. Uh, both of them did incredibly well. Ridiculous fishing more even than Luft trousers, and um, that from you know you go to bed uh, one day and you are doing uh, you have a job selling computers and working on games, and then the next day you wake up and you don't need the job selling computers. It was very strange, but I think that was it for us. The moment that things switched from hopefully we can do this you know, in a year to, okay, what are our plans in the next five years? Uh, That was them. The story of of working with a a, a publisher, how has that changed? Uh, You you know, you made this deal with Devolver. Is that process still pretty similar these days if someone were to go work with a a publisher or has that changed? No, absolutely not. The, The funny thing is back in... Back when, um, publishers needed games. Now, games need publishers. Mm. The, entire, the entire way this industry worked has flipped, and it's partially because of publishers. Because when you're an independent developer, the way you do marketing is as an independent developer. You do it as an individual. You go to events. Uh, but it also means you've got news for people in the press, people in the media, like once every two years. right? You rev that up really quickly. You reestablish contact with the major websites. You check if the people that you were talking to are still there. You make some connections with Twitch streamers. But most of the time, you're focused on game development. Publishers can continuously continuously create good content for press, for media, for Twitch streamers, for anybody. So they can keep those contacts really warm. They can stay up to date. And they can spread out their risk across multiple games. We can't do that. So... What happens is, first, publishers needed games because they needed content. But then at some point, publishers became such a prominent um, part of our industry that it was really impossible to for independent developers to keep up with the marketing. There's not a lot of indies that can compete with a Devolver or a Raw Fury or um, you know, a Annapurna or any of those 
So now it's the other way around. To compete with the publishers, you need a publisher. Um, so that has changed a lot. And publishers have an overflow of, of games. Um, there are people scouting for good games 24-7. Um, without a publisher, this has become really hard. Um, and I don't know, like I've always found it weird that independent was tied to whether you do or do not have a publisher. Mm -hmm. But uh, especially nowadays, independent without a publisher, you have to be either very certain about your game or very stubborn or just not care. When I think of you, I think you as someone who does, who is able to get himself out there and, and get in front of people and people want to talk to you. What was it? Was that a conscious decision to turn yourself into someone that people think of when they want to talk about games? Not really. I mean, I mean, yes, at some point, but at first, you know, I'm I'm a programmer by by trade, right? Like that's what I love doing. I'm sitting behind a computer right now, and on my right screen is a whole bunch of code, and on my left screen is what we're recording right now. But as soon as this is over, I'm going back to the code, right? Right. Um, that's what I love doing, and I've always loved doing that. I, I think um, very early on when Flamber was just started, we had no money. We were effectively um, university dropouts. Uh, now, in the Netherlands, that is not that severe of a thing. Uh, student debt isn't really a thing. We have a pretty uh, welfare-based society. Um, but the, um, the only way for us to get to London, which is where the English-speaking press was, uh, because the Dutch press writes in Dutch, which means that your reach is very limited, um, the only way to get to London was we had heard that some people would pay you to fly to a place if you would give a talk. Sure. Uh, but the only way to get people interested in having you give a talk was to do talks. So I started doing talks in the Netherlands about Super Great Box. And then at some point, an organizer from an event in London was at one of those talks and invited me over to speak there. And that's kind of when I started meeting English speaking press. But it's also when my talk started uh, reaching further because there were people at that event that would then invite me to other events. And I realized that this was a way to reach out and make contacts and, and learn from people and meet other people that would give other talks at those same events. Um, I think that's kind of when the switch happened to, okay, I want to do this public speaking thing, half because it will allow me to meet other interesting people. And half because as I travel and do this more, I will learn more and maybe I can help other people, uh, you know, who can't travel like me. Um, maybe I can have other people share in that knowledge. So uh, that's kind of when that switch happened. Um, it became my Twitter started go growing out of hand probably in like 2013 as well. Um, and that's sort of when I had to make the choice between do I want to be like a minor public figure? Or do I do I want to make video games in silence? And I think that was uh, that was a conscious decision that I wanted to wanted to be a minor public figure because I don't know I there was nobody that looked like me right right there was no Dutch Arab there was definitely not a prominent Muslim game developer as far as I knew um, and that was sort of the first time I started to realize like hey there is a kid out there that would make video games if only they knew there was place for somebody like them. And I guess that's also where my activism for emergent territory sort of started. You talk about how like right now, Vlambeer is surviving on the sales of, of older games. You have another game coming out, but right now these catalog sales continue to chug along. Um, I, I guess, I mean, just how does that work? So I think the trick there is, um, and this is something that was a very early decision of us, of ours as well. Flamber is a studio that can really rapidly make games if we want to, right? Um, JW, my co-founder, is an incredible prototyper um, and really fast at, at creating an interesting gameplay loop. Um, and then together, or with our teams, um, we can usually work that out into a game in like a year, a year and a half, which is... If you look at most games, most games that sell well have a tail that is, have a sales tail, like a sort of a drop off that can be two to five years until it really dries up, right? Mm -hmm. So we realized if we did a number of games, smaller games quickly, we could add up those tails. 
and then turn it into a number that would be enough to sustain our studio. Now, your tail is usually somewhat defined by your initial sales peak. Uh, and that has changed a bit over the years with sales and bundles and uh, giveaways. But usually uh, what you want to do is you want to get the peak as high, the peaks as high as possible so that the drop off, even if it's percentually like pretty high, it still ends up high enough to make you say like a few thousand dollars a month, right? Um, if you can hit that for one game, you have a few thousand dollars a month. If you can do that for three or four games, then you have enough to, to run a small studio. Um, with Vlambeer, we have a few games that still make a lot of money comparatively uh, for how big our team is. So um, even though over the years we're earning less and less, obviously, uh, not releasing any games, uh, we're still at a point where we're relatively comfortable um, we can still afford going to events and, you know, just living um, with quite some savings in case we need them. That's, that has always been a rule at Flambeer. If we're down to um, a few months of money, we had to drop everything. Uh, that has now changed to if we're down to a few years of money, we have to drop everything and make a thing. Um, because I guess we grew up and our lives need a little bit more <laughs> certainty. Mm -hmm. um, so, yeah, that's where we're at right now. Vlambeer is not like a lot of people think of Vlambeer as the studio that has just like millions and millions of dollars sitting in like a vault of money. That's not are really, there any are there any studios of your size that are like that? I mean, that doesn't seem reasonable. I mean, there are a few studios that are like that, but they're usually the games that are um, right. Okay, that yeah. did incredibly well, right? Yes. But right. most studios like ours li live on a we have a year of two years in reserves, right? Mm -hmm. um, that any any studio that can get that will do that. And then there's a number of studios that are much larger than ours. As soon as you're talking 10, 15, 20 people, you're just talking an entirely different risk game. Right. right? Vlambeer is two people. We scale up for our games with freelancers or friends. And that's that's it. So our, our runway can be relatively secure. But we've always been very let's say careful with growing because we do know that as soon as you hit five people, the ball game changes. As soon as you hit 10 people, the ball game changes entirely. And then from there, it just goes up, risk goes up, runways get shorter. Um, and I think you're seeing that right now in the industry as well. A lot of people are just hitting their runway and they're, they're running out of time and it's scary to watch for a lot of them. How are you feeling about uh, the future, about di different business models, subscriptions uh, really coming into to, to the forefront here, and just in general about the way people might be changing the way they spend money considering the recession due to the global pandemic right now? I mean, I think, the, I think all of it will hurt. Um, here, but here's the thing. I think a lot of it will hurt. Um, a lot of changes over time have always hurt a lot of people, right? When things switch to mobile and then on mobile, it switched to pay what you, uh, to free to play. And then DLC came in and microtransactions came up and uh, subscriptions started coming in, uh, the flash market dying, um, the sort of like budget market dying in 2008, like all of those changes will always take down a lot of studios, but it will always create place for new ones. Um, yeah, like a lot of a lot of stuff will crash and burn in the nearby future. I, d I don't think that is any way. There's any way we can look at what is happening right now and say, well, we're out of the crash, right? Because the industry has been crashing for like eight years or something, right? Um, we can't say we're out of that. Like we still haven't hit rock bottom. Bottom, and despite that, there is this flourishing of games, right? There's more interesting, beautiful games being made now than ever before even though there are also more studios falling over, dying, being absorbed or, or uh, acquired than ever before. But I think what we're seeing is sort of the counter movement to the indie boom. It turns out that having this many small developers competing for the same space is really hard to sustain for most of them. So now you're seeing a conglomeration, right? Indie developers are finding their place under publishers. Publishers are merging with larger companies. Uh, large studios are starting to split their risk across smaller projects. Um, and you're even seeing uh, 
giant AAA studios starting to split up their games into smaller parts um, because the model just isn't sustainable. The $60 model for AAA isn't sustainable. The mm-hmm. uh, race to the bottom for any developers isn't sustainable. The subscription model slash free-to-play model on a mobile isn't sustainable. Like None of these things are sustainable. So uh, I think we might need the crash. I don't know who will make it through and who won't. I don't know if Lambert will make it through or it won't. I do know that it's necessary because with this incredible seismic shift of uh, subscription gaming coming up, everything's about to change. Like Twitch was the last time everything changed from make a game that people will play to make a game that people will keep playing, right? And now comes the shift from, okay, it doesn't matter whether people play a lot or just a little because we it's a subscription model. So how we get paid might vary based on the, you know, the terms of our contract. Um, if that is people, the more people play, the more money you get, then expect a lot more of that free to play, uh, design, um, infinite engagement, uh, fear of missing out, expect way more of that. If it's just, you get a bag of money up front to make the game and then they deal with monetization, then expect a lot of like, small, interesting, weird narrative games uh, or like fast action games, basically a sort of return to form for arcade. Um, I don't know which one it's going to be. Uh, either way, a lot of a lot of what we're doing won't work anymore uh, as an industry. So we'll have to find out new ways to do those things. You talked about a list of things that are unsustainable in games. It, it feels like we've been... Um... Like even like you, the, the crash might have been happening for eight years, but like gaming has just been constantly changing nonstop since the beginning. Uh, is there a point where like gaming feels more rigid and and more um, like more like movies, where like they have a model for making a movie that's been in place for you know fifty years now, and they haven't changed it up much. There's been some indie people come in to try some different stuff here and there, but mostly the model is the same. Uh, does gaming get to that point or is it just there's just too much possibility for it for it to really be any one model? I think the main thing, right, like I'm, I'm starting to think that maybe this upcoming wave might be it for a while. Um, mm-hmm. The subscription model might be it for a while because we haven't movies has eventually sort of ended up there as well. Right. Mm-hmm. They've had 80 years to figure this out and that's where they ended up. Um, but I think a lot of this is dependent on what the audience wants. Right. And I think what the audience wants is pay little, play much. Right. Uh, which is what we slowly as a medium have been converging to. Um, and we've slowly, like it's been, I don't want to call it a th- like a death by a thousand cuts, but it's kind of what happened, right? We went mm-hmm. from, you pay $60 for a game made by, f- uh, by like 15 people to you pay $60 for a game made by 200 people over three years. Um, so it needs to sell a lot more, but also it needs to stand out a lot more. So we need to spend more money on spending on standing out. So that loop has been going on and it it wasn't going to stand anyway, right? The only way a lot of the large games nowadays happen is because massive injections of money that then lead to design that needs to make back that money. And a lot of people don't like that design. Um, so we needed a shift because we've seen with some larger games those investments might flop pretty hard um, if if people just get angry enough about what's in there. Uh, so the industry has always been sort of like volatile, I guess, like it, mm-hmm. unpredictable. But it has always been somewhat predictable in the next year, two years. Uh, if you got really unlucky, you got right in the middle of one of those like very seismic shifts. But I, I don't know if games will... The games is so much... Movies is kind of the same thing anywhere, right? right? Like the context for most movies is you watch it on a TV or a computer screen. Uh, if you're traveling, you might watch it on a mobile phone. There's a there's a play button and that does it. Games has so many distinct categories of gaming that are completely different in how they... Like if you've ever been to a mobile games conference and then gone through like a big screen games conference or whatever you want to call it, um, they're they're completely different worlds. They have nothing to do with each other. Mm-hmm. Um, the only thing that they have in common is that video games get made. But even what those video games are is completely different. So 
I don't know if they'll ever coalesce to like a stable thing. I don't think games necessarily needs that. All I know is that where we are right now isn't going to work. And I think that's why we're seeing this really rapid acceleration towards anything else. Um, because a lot of devs just need the money. Like I, th- I don't know if I think subscription is good. I think it might actually be really bad for us as an industry. I do know there's a lot of amazing developers that if they don't take those subscription deals that are out there right now, they're out of business. Right. Like how would we know how would we know if this is good or not? It seems yeah, it seems so impossible to like actually see this future and know if we're going to appreciate it or if it's if it's good for developers. Like how do you see that future at all? I mean, I don't think it's good for developers, but the alternative right. is worse. Mm-hmm. Right? So the the thing is developers just have to survive some way. Um the subscription stuff, it it makes space for some really interesting games that can't be made right now. It also removes space for pretty much anybody who wants to compete with subscription models because unless people go, okay, I pay $15 for this subscription service a month, but I'm also going to pay $60 for this game that isn't on that subscription service, which seems unlikely to me given the amount of games that are on the subscription services. Um, I don't think this is going to help developers. Like The way this is going to work is we're going to have to start selling our games to companies rather than to players, uh, which is kind of exactly the opposite of what the original indie boom was. Um, but I don't see alternatives. Like I just, I, I wouldn't see how we could avoid this future because who would go and say, well, I ideologically disagree with what subscription models are, so I'm not going to take this hundreds right, of thousands of dollar bag of money Mm-hmm. Uh, to release my game on a subscription service. Like, it's it's folly. Nobody would do that. There's probably, like, mortgages and lives and rents at stake. Like, you take the bag. Let's talk about gamedev.world. Uh, this is, so you, you started off saying, like, Flambeer's almost like a side project. Uh, it, it, are things like gamedev.world your main project then now? I think so, yeah. I think GameDev.World really... So it's an initiative by Sarah O'Malley, who is a voice actress, um, um, and uh, myself. Um, and it started years ago trying to translate game manuals, uh, game engine manuals to different languages uh, because we realized that one of the biggest obstacles to the flourishing of game development around the world in non-English territories was that it's just really hard to get started if you don't know English. Um and then we realized that a lot of the engine producers had internal efforts to start working on that. So we decided to look at what else would be possible to, to bridge that language gap. And it turned out conferences are also in English. So GameDev.World was created to be in, in virtual, accessible, no travel bans, no visa restrictions, no money restrictions conference for anybody uh, where we translate the talks. Uh, but the the real goal of Game of the World is to allow people from anywhere in the world to have similar opportunities in terms of knowledge sharing and gaining knowledge. Um, so that goal is what we've been chasing. I think that's always been sort of a goal of mine uh, is to to give people around the world the same access to resources that we have. And even in my story, right, I still had to find a way to get to London. Right to have any opportunity at all in this industry, even for somebody in the Netherlands, which we think of as like a a wealthy uh, international country, we still have that extra, that extra little obstacle in our way. Um, And that's, that's just the Netherlands. If you hop like 500 miles or like 5,000 miles in any direction, 5,000 kilometers in any direction, it, it becomes practically impossible to stand out or to even reach people like that. Um, or people in the press or people in the industry. So uh, that's been an effort of mine for for years. And I think I, I think Game of the World partially came, I can't speak for Sarah, obviously, but for me, partially it came from this idea that a lot of what I do is something that really only I do, right? Mm-hmm. There's not anybody else who has the privilege to be able to travel around the world 300 days a year speaking to developers that are just starting out or just starting their community or uh, helping out with negotiating with governments or whatever, you know, I do in these different territories. Um, 
there's not a lot of people who have the, the, the space, the financial space, the time, the, the, the willingness to, to do that. Um, but I also realized that that means that if I'm not there, then nobody can do it at the moment. Mm-hmm. Um, so I thought I need to turn this into a structure. Right? I need to turn this into something that isn't dependent on me because I've always been taught that the best effort you can do leads to your own obs- like obsoleteness. Right, that's the best work you can do. Isn't do work that won't be dependent on you anymore. Um, so I think game dev world part of that is just an effort to do that. To to if anything happens to me, or if I can't do this anymore, or if my life changes in such a way that I that I can't keep that up, that there is a structure that will connect people around the world uh, across language barriers uh, across. Uh, the obstacles that our political situation, our economical situations create. Um, so that's, you know, one half of the hope of game of the world. I can't exactly speak for what Sarah uh, sure. is trying to achieve, but for me, I think that's really important. Well, I mean, for that, like for reaching that goal, where are you in the process of getting to a point where if you suddenly did evaporate and, and we needed to rely on game dev dot world to get what we get out of you now, how close are we to that? I mean, we're getting pretty close. Like the biggest issue with this for now is sustainability, right? Game Dev World is a, is an extremely expensive event. Uh, translating talks from eight languages to eight languages alone is over a hundred thousand yeah. dollars. Um, getting sponsors to understand the value of that and support that uh, is incredibly hard. But um, in terms of structure for the event, I think we have it down to. We have it down really well. We just did a fundraising event for developers that were affected by the um, cancellation of GDC. And just like our main event, it was a live virtual conference that anybody could tune into. It was a bit more chill than conferences. We had some musical performances, stuff like that. Uh, we did all that to raise money. And the the event part of it, the live production of it, was extremely smooth. Um, we had quite some issues the first time around because we were working with a team that just hasn't done online life events before. Um, so even though there were a lot of issues, the event went off well, but this time it was just, everything was incredibly smooth. Uh, everything worked well. Um, our team is good at sourcing, uh, speakers from around the world. Um, we have, you know, a great, a great support team. Uh, at this point, I think the main the main value I offer is, you know, I, I help with direction uh, and I help with, you know, getting sponsors. Um, so as soon as we can get a more stable, as soon as we can get a more stable structure for funding and sponsorship, or maybe even shift it to an optional ticket, you know, um, we're playing with ideas. But as soon as we figure that out, uh, you know, it, it might just be a standalone thing, which would be that will make me very happy. You hear a lot that video games are recession resistant or recession proof or immune. Um, we, we are going into a recession right now as the economy closes down to rightfully deal with COVID-19. Um, and people are playing more games and you could see this if you, I mean, if you just like glance at the stocks, like gaming mm-hmm. stocks are doing pretty well. St- and, and like, I mean, like Sony's giving a hundred million dollars to fight this Rockstar's giving 5% of what they're making. Cause you could tell they're making enough money right now. And they feel like we're not going to be the ones profiteering off of this. But I, I, to me, when I hear recession resistant, even that means that there are going to be people that like slip through the cracks still when risk, when people get more afraid of the risk of spending money in an environment like this, do you think of any, does anyone come to mind? Are there any parts of the world that you think might get left out because of the, the coming recession? I mean, honestly, I don't think games are recession proof at all. I, I, I always hear that as well, but um, I think it, in the first response to something like this is very good for games, right? The immediate response is, oh God, I'm out of a job or, oh God, I'm, uh, I'm stuck at home in this case, or, oh God, like, let's play some video games. Uh, first response is always good. Second response is not going to be good. Like when you think about it, games are already not in a financially healthy place when the economy is running well, right? Even when the economy is running well, studios need acquisitions, need deals, need uh, need buyouts. Um, 
lay off staff when they complete a project, uh, shutter entire studios, publishers looking for ways to cut costs. Like even when the economy is well, we aren't healthy as an industry. So when the economy goes down, what most users are going to do, what most players are going to do is not buy that $60 game on launch because there's infinite stuff to play. So yeah, we will, we will still do good numbers for sure. Like I don't think the games industry will collapse under the recession immediately, but I'm definitely not thinking of this as like, Oh good. Everybody is stuck at home. They're going to play so many video games right now. Right. It's just not how player behavior is at the moment. Players get one or two games that they play a lot and they won't have money to try more games. So they're just going to keep playing the games that they're playing already. Um, so I don't know. Like I, I hear that story a lot. I don't think anybody has ever like actually ran the numbers on that. Well, I mean, in 2008, like in 2008, when uh, it was Bobby Kotick that said it, it was like, oh, gaming's recession proof or whatever. And then right at that time, it's like, all the money that was going to the Australian like support development community, like Australia had a bunch of de developers that supported games that were being made in America and elsewhere. And that money just dried up and that entire industry collapsed yeah. in one country. It's like, is that's, that's the kind of stuff that's still going to happen here. Right. And, and absolutely. Like it'll, but I think it'll happen everywhere across the world. I think the, the, the whole idea for like, Boy Kodak saying that stuff is recession proof. Like maybe on the Activision scale in 2009, that was true. But if you look at Activision now, yeah, they're making more money than ever. Uh, it's still not, it still not seems like they're doing super great at the moment though. Um, I think that's true for everybody. I think nobody is doing super great right now. I think everybody's trying to figure it out except for maybe the storefronts. They seem to be doing fine. Um, like I think being the I think being the middleman right now is the way to make money in video games. Uh, turns out you just need Fortnite money to do it. <laughs> um, so I guess for everybody who doesn't have Fortnite money, this might be this might be pretty rough. Um, Remember when the internet was supposed to be like the way for like individuals to like sell things to each other and yeah. like get rid of the middleman? <laughs> well, isn't that? But that's kind of the thing we were talking about earlier, right? Like it's this strange time where. The, the ability to sell things individually meant that people individually had to do everything. And as soon as somebody realized that they can be a person that can take away some of that is a way to earn money, they started slowly – everybody started slowly gravitating towards that because they were better at it because they did it more. Yeah. So then they became services and then the services became middlemen. And I think – this is just a cycle. I think this cycle will repeat forever. I think we will see attempts at breaking away from the subscription model when that takes over the industry. Um, and I think eventually one of those will be successful where people just are like, I don't want to have a subscription to a thing that I have to pay for every month. I will just pay for this thing once and then play it. Um, I guess eventually that'll happen. Um, I think that's also where, for now, the competition to subscription models is, right? Individual subscriptions to infinite games, to games as a service game. But I think part of this is why I love the games industry, honestly, is it's so hard to predict where we're going to be in a year. Um, it really is. <laughs> it really, it just, it's incredibly hard to figure out where we are. And you can, you can take, a, you can do extrapolation and go like, okay, this is where we're going to be in a month, in six months, in a year. And then like one month in, somebody announces a thing that none of us would have even like abstractly thought about. And now all of it is wrong. I, I just, it felt like overnight we were in, in su subscription world. Uh, yeah. I, I know Game Pass has been around for a while, but it's like, you know, it's a thing maybe you get and most, most people are ignoring it. And then just suddenly it's like everyone has to have a subscription. That's the future. That's where we're going. And it, it just feels ubiquitous and everywhere now. So yep. yeah, it's just, it's so hard to predict. Cloud gaming fits with it really yeah. well. Like all of the, it's all happening. I have no idea where we're going, but um, I don't know if it'll be good for my studio. I don't know if it'll be good for anybody else's studio, but the thing is no, no matter what happens, I guess many of us will be okay. Uh, mm -hmm. Because we'll just find a new thing. Um, like it'll create new opportunities. It'll create new jobs. It'll create new studios, new business models. Um, I always say like, maybe we won't be fine, but games will be fine. And I think that's true here as well. Uh, Rami, thank you so much for taking the time to talk with me. I, I really appreciate it.
This was fun. Yeah, thanks for having me. Yeah, absolutely. Um, do you want to tell people where they can find you? Want to go ahead and uh, give your social media? Yeah, I am uh, Rami Ismo. You can find me on Twitter at T H A underscore Rami. Uh, you can find me at RamiIsmail.com. And um, if you have any questions or uh, you want to, uh, you know, chat or send an email, you can do that at Rami at Vlambeer.com. And thank you to everybody for listening. We'll be back again next week with another new episode. For now, though, have a good one and goodbye. <laughs>